So I have been reading through the Ethereum improvement proposals recently, and I'm going to start making screencasts breaking all of these things down. One of the first ones I want to start with is the ERC-223 token standard. And ERC-223 is a proposal to fix a potential limitation with ERC-20. Now, if you've been following Ethereum at all over the last couple months, you are probably familiar with the idea of protocol tokens or these ERC-20 tokens that everybody is ICOing and raising massive amounts of money with and trading on exchanges and things like that. Um, the, the entire um, kind of ecosystem around these tokens is a complete joke right now. I mean, companies that can't even ship products are raising tons of money. It's just completely fueled by speculation and greed where people are trying to buy up these tokens and then flip them for a profit, even though they know they're completely worthless and it's all gonna completely collapse on itself. But that being said, the actual underlying technology that's fueling all this is pretty interesting. So I've kind of taken like a passive interest in it. And all these tokens right now that are being ICO'd conform to this standard that is colloquially referred to as ERC-20. And right here is the interface for an ERC-20 token for a fictional token called DecipherCoin. When you want to send tokens from one account to another, you call this transfer function on the token contract, pass the address you want to send the tokens to, the amount you want to send, and then you send tokens to them. But if you're interacting with contracts, you use a slightly different workflow. You're going to use this approved transfer from workflow instead, where you approve the contract address to have custodian access over a certain amount of your tokens, and then that contract can then call into this um, token contract and call transfer from to transfer tokens from your account. So it's like this multi-part workflow instead. It's a little confusing, but this does work, and we've built a pretty large ecosystem around this workflow. One of the potential problems, though, is what happens if a user calls transfer and sends tokens not to an Ethereum account, but to a contract address? Well, in that case, the contract address that received the tokens would have no way coded into it to then call this transfer function again and transfer the tokens to a different address. So by transferring to a contract address, those tokens are effectively lost forever. And this might be an accident on the user's part, but there's no mechanism to prevent this from happening and there's no recourse when it does. You might be thinking, well, how big of a problem is this really? Well, if we look at some of the popular tokens on Ethereum, for example, Gollum, we'll see that there's been $93,000 worth of Gollum tokens that have been accidentally transferred to the Gollum contract address alone instead of transferred to other Ethereum accounts. And these $93,000 worth of tokens are effectively lost forever because people just keep accidentally sending them to it. Let's take a look at basic attention token. In basic attention token, there's you know almost $15,000 worth of BAT tokens that are locked up, mostly from this one transaction here, where this guy sent 138,000 tokens by mistake to the BAT contract address instead of to the address he was trying to send it to. And this was 28 days ago when BAT was trading at like almost 30 cents. So this guy probably lost, you know, like $35,000 in this one transaction and he got wrecked. And when we're dealing with immutable hacker currencies, getting wrecked is a really, you know, big thing. It's something that's out there in the public and it should be the burden of application developers to make it as hard as possible for users to do stupid things and lose their money. That is what ERC-223 is proposing. It's a mechanism to help prevent accidental transfer of tokens to contracts that are not prepared to handle them and uh, having them be lost forever. Now this concept, by the way, exists when you send Ether to contracts. It's called a fallback function. For example, this is the First Blood token contract. And you'll notice that they have this function here that all that it does is throw. This is what's called a fallback function. The way that this works is that if somebody just sends Ether to a contract address, so not calling a function on the contract, but just sends Ether as if it were you know, sending Ether to a normal Ethereum account, this function is gonna be invoked, a function that has no arguments or no parameters. Well, if you throw out of that contract, all of, of that function rather, all that's gonna happen is that it's gonna consume the gas, sent with the transaction, and then it'll refund all of the ether that's been sent with it. So this is effectively a fail-safe mechanism that if someone accidentally sends you ether, just return it to them. And if I were going to write this into my decipher coin, all that I would need to do is add a fallback function. And because this is a later version of Solidity, I would need to add the payable modifier, but just say function payable throw. And all that this is saying is that if somebody sends ether to this contract, it's gonna go to the fallback function, 
throw out of it and return their ether. Problem is that when you call transfer and try to send tokens to a contract address, you're not actually calling into that contract. So there's no way that contract can implement some sort of fallback function to reject the tokens if they're accidentally sent. That logic would need to be implemented within the token contract itself. So ERC-23 is proposing that instead of just transferring tokens to an address when we receive it, first we're going to check whether or not the address we are sending to is a contract address or if it's just a normal Ethereum account. Well, how do you do that? In Ethereum, there is a opcode called ext code size. And this opcode will take an address as an argument and it will return the bytecode length that lives at that address. So if it's a contract address, this will be greater than zero. If it's a normal Ethereum address, this will be exactly zero because there's no bytecode. And in Solidity, we can dip into the individual Ethereum opcodes natively if we need to. So let's see how we might write a function like that. We'll write a function called isContract, and we're going to try to determine if an address that's passed in as an argument is a contract address or if it's a normal Ethereum account. And this will be a private function because we don't want to expose it, and it will return um, a Boolean of isContract true or false. Now, first we're gonna make a uint called length, which will be the length of the bytecode at that address. And then we can dip into the native Ethereum opcodes by wrapping it in this assembly block. And here we can then say that the length is equal to x code size and then the address. And if the length is greater than zero, then we can return true and know that this is a contract. Or else we can return false and know that it's not. And then we could say in this transfer function here that if 2 is a normal f address, then transfer tokens just as normal. But if 2 is a contract address, use a slightly different workflow. And here's what that slightly different workflow might look like. Bear with me for a second while I do this but I'm going to add another function to the contract interface, and this function will also be called transfer, only it's going to take a third argument of type bytes that is arbitrary metadata that can be passed with the function invocation. Now, this might look a little bit strange to you because we have not one, but we have two functions that are both called transfer, but they're not actually the same thing because this function here takes a third parameter of type bytes, whereas this function only takes two parameters. In programming, this is what's called a variadic function, variadic function, which means that you have a function that has the same name, but can be invoked in different ways with different parameters. Normally, when you have a variadic function, you're gonna have something like this. So you have transfer x comma y of two, two arities, and then you have transfer x, y, z with three arities. And normally, the entire purpose of the lower arity function is going to be to wrap data and then invoke the higher arity function with just default values for the missing arities. So for example, transfer x, y in this case, all that this function would do would be to invoke transfer x, y, and then an empty byte array as the default value for z in this function. And that way you can implement all your logic within one function of the hierarchy. And what, what is the reason why we're doing this? Well, one really good reason might be for backwards compatibility purposes. So this function signature right here that has the two arity transfer function, this is what is part of the ERC-20 standard. So any contract that is trying to work with ERC-20 compatible tokens is expecting a function of this signature. So if we add a higher arity function, we want to still preserve the lower arity function for backwards compatibility purposes. I should also elaborate on one other thing about function signatures. So when I'm referring to function signature, I'm referring to this right here, which is the name of the function and the types of the parameters that it takes. Well, in Ethereum, there's a very important concept called method ID. And method ID is a four byte and four bytes is eight hex characters, right? So there's an eight hex character sequence 
that uniquely identifies an individual function within the context of a contract. And the method ID is generated from the function signature. So for example, on this transfer function, which is the ERC20 transfer function, I can calculate the method ID by taking the SHA3 hash, right? SHA3 hash of the signature, which in this case would be transfer, which is the name of the function, and then the types of the arguments it takes. So address is type one, and then uint256 is type two. And if I make this entire thing a string and take the SHA hash of it, I'm gonna get some 32 byte string as a result. And if I take the first four bytes of this 32 byte string, right, first four bytes, that will be a unique eight character sequence that serves as the method ID to identify this transfer function. And I know for the ERC20 transfer function that that sequence is something like A9059CBB. And that is the unique method ID. And I could verify that by opening my terminal and doing web3.sha3 on the transfer address uint256 string, which is the function signature. And you'll see I get this 32 byte hash as a result, but I could get the first four bytes of it by doing substring 010 to get the first eight hex characters plus the 0x. And you'll see that this A9059CBB is the first four bytes of that. And I could go to any ERC20 compatible contract, for example, the basic attention token, and look at the bytecode on Etherscan. And I could just control F A9059CBB, and I'll see that that byte sequence is present in the bytecode. So this is kind of like an interesting thing that you can do is you can scan the bytecode of various contracts and look for specific sequences that you know are method IDs. And in this case, if you see this, you can have a pretty high certainty that the contract being deployed is ERC20 compatible. Likewise, um, we could also go look at the transactions that have been made in this contract. So I'd imagine that most of them are just transferring tokens between each other. And we could see that the invocation calls A9059CBB because this is calling the transfer function. So when you're calling the transfer function, you need to have that signature or that method ID in the actual invocation data. To bring this all back to earth for a second, what we could do in this transfer function is first create an abstract interface. Now I'm going to call this token receiver. And what we are going to say is that any contract that we try to transfer tokens to must conform to this interface. And this interface is going to have exactly one function, and it's going to be called token fallback. And it's going to take three parameters, the address of who's sending it, the value of what is being sent, and then the arbitrary bytes of the metadata. And this is just an interface. We don't need to implement this in our token contract, but we're basically going to expect that any contract we are sending tokens to conforms to this. So in our transfer function, it's going to look something, and this might just be like a little bit of pseudocode, but we're basically going to say if is contract to, so if we are sending to a contract, we'll do our normal updates, which consists of something like, you know, balances of the message.sender minus equals the value, balances of two plus equals the value. But here, we're going to generate a new in-memory implementation of that contract. So token receiver receiver equals token receiver, and then the two like that. And then we are going to try and invoke that function. So we are going to say token fallback, and we're going to pass in the message.sender, the value, and the data. And then, you know, we would call the transfer event, just like normal, only now we're going to have a different parameter on it, because we're going to have that data parameter. I don't know if I actually updated this, but um, in the new interface in ERC23 that it's proposing, you would actually just then add bytes data to that transfer event also. And then maybe you would return true. Now, what is this actually going to do? Well, in Ethereum, transactions are what's called atomic, which means that the entire transaction needs to all succeed together or it needs to all fail together. So if even one line fails or th throws an error in this entire function, then the entire thing will fail and revert. So in this case, we're saying that if it's a contract, that we are trying to transfer tokens to, well then that contract must implement the token fallback function because we're gonna try and invoke it. 
And we're gonna try to invoke it with that very specific method ID. And if that function errors, right? So if there's an error, then this entire thing will fail and all the tokens will be reverted and no token balances will actually be updated. So it's a way to enforce that if you are trying to call transfer and send that to a contract address, that contract address must be explicitly whitelisted to handle that by implementing this token fallback function. And again, any function could implement that token fallback function. This is the abstract interface that whatever contract wants to handle token transfers can conform to. So I encourage you to check out on GitHub, this guy Dexeron that proposed this token standard has put up a GitHub repository called ERC23 tokens, where he's provided some example code for the interface that this contract would have and sample implementation of what a token contract could look like. So yeah, this is an interesting proposal to extend the ERC20 token standard to help add kind of fail-safe functionality so that less noobs are getting wrecked by sending tokens to places that they're not expecting to. And as the ecosystem evolves, we're going to need to think more and more critically about how we can add best practices into these contracts. So again, if you like this video and you like this kind of content, give the video a like, get in touch, and follow the Decipher Media channel because we're going to be doing a lot more Web3-related content in the coming months. Peace!